Hello everyone, Vanessa from Refold here, recording the intro because Clayton was having tech difficulties. In this week's episode, we're joined by Chris Sandita, a language learner and professional linguist. Join Clayton and Chris as they discuss Chris's journey from a Spanish learner to a full-fledged linguist. All right. So, Chris, thank you for coming on. Thank you. So, um, for the listeners, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? So, tell us who you are, uh, why this is an awesome interview, uh, what your background is with languages and the language learning community. Sure. Yeah. So, my name is uh, Christopher Sandita. Um, you can call me Chris. Uh, I think. And what was the second question? Sorry. Uh, what is your relationship with uh, like language and oh. like, the language learning community? Yeah, so um, I've been interested in uh, languages ever since I was a kid. And then um, I eventually, uh, w I eventually with the motivation of like finding more about the languages my grandmother spoke and my great grandparents in the Philippines spoke that led me into a uh, into considering linguistics as a career option. Um, so I ended up I ended up getting um, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in linguistics. And then uh, but now I am working in um, in another I'm working in the tech sector um, where I get to um, uh, employ language and linguistics and linguistics concepts on a, on a particular level. But uh, uh, yeah, so that's where I'm at right now. Um, and I, but I'm still like a, a language geek um, at heart, and I'm still I love learning different languages in my spare time. You know, whether I'm going, I, I, whether I'm interested in the culture, or I want to meet people in my community, or traveling, or um, or I'm just curious about how something works in the language. So, so um, you, if if I understand your history correctly. Um, uh, you started learning Spanish very early on, and that might have led you to becoming ultimately like a Spanish teacher. Yeah. So um, when I was in when I was in eighth grade, I was finally able to take Spanish as a class, in which I I wanted to do since elementary school. My mom would talk about her Spanish classes, and the older kids, you know, they would talk about their Spanish class, and they would show me their Spanish homework, and I would think, oh, wow, it's totally awesome, so, um, and I, you know, I really, I really wanted to learn Spanish, you know, primarily for two reasons, you know, one is because I'm American, and, and it's an important language here in the States, and um, number two is because I'm also Filipino, and the, the long history of the Philippines as a Spanish colony um, and its impact on our culture and languages um, motivated me to um, to study Spanish. Uh, after high school, um, I my family and I moved to a small town, um, and uh, I didn't I didn't go to college right away, uh, but I I ended up going i ended up uh, finding work as uh, a spanish teacher at a local at a local school there um so i did that for a few years um it wasn't um i was more of a i was more of a teacher's aide honestly at the time and then they needed somebody who would teach spanish um uh, to the students there so that's what i did but um it's the previous life from so so long ago <laughs> yeah it's interesting um I, my first high school that I went to, um, the, the math teacher, one of the math teachers also happened to be, um, I, he also happened to be Latin American, mm -hmm. um, and he spoke Spanish and he was partially educated in Latin America, partially in the U S. Um, so he was originally hired as like an actual, like high school math teacher, but he also happened to speak Spanish and he ended up being the Spanish teacher as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that can, that can happen. I think yeah. people, especially you know, in, in rural or smaller towns, people take what they can. And, yeah. yeah. And, and that was my situation. It was very, it was a very rural town um, near Mount Rainier in Washington state. So, but yeah. Okay. And um, you taught, Spanish, and then at some point you 
you went into actual like formal linguistics, right? You got your degree. Yeah. So um, that um, going into linguistics wasn't really my plan. Um, I, uh, from a young age, my my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, he he made me promise to become a physician, and I'm like, oh yes, grandpa, and I'm like, okay, and that and that feeling all, always. Um, that stuck. I mean, that that promise stuck with me, you know, through high school. You know, I was I, I remember looking up like uh, pre med programs, you know, for the University of Washington. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do this and that. Um, but then as time went on, you know, I just didn't. I just wasn't feeling it. You know, um, it was. It, it just wasn't the, the medical field. Just wasn't my thing. You know, it's just not my passion, and that's and that's fine. You know, um, and but. I, I know, but I was like wondering, what is my passion? And I had no idea what linguistics was. You know, I thought lingu I thought I thought maybe linguistics had to do with translation, and that's certainly the the view of many people. You know, today, they, you know, they they assume I'm an interpreter or a translator, or they they might they might recommend me a job and say, "Oh, Chris, they're they're hiring translators. You speak Spanish." I'm like, "Nah, translation is not my thing either." Um, uh, but it wasn't until, like as I mentioned earlier, I wanted, you know, um, I wanted to know more about my family's. Uh, I, I, I was into genealogy, and uh, and I want and and the more I found out where my ancestors were from, I was curious about the languages spoken there. So, and just to give you some background, yeah, I mentioned I'm Filipino, right? And my family, uh, my family, for the past since my grandparents generation they they're from manila but but even even then both of my grandmothers they're they're from the Bicol region so Bicol is their native language and i was always curious about the um Bicol, um which is a language closely related to tagalog um and then as i was doing genealogy i found out that my grandpa's dad is from cebu He's in, they speak Cebuan. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm Bisaya too, you know? And I want to know more about that. And then I spoke with my grandfather's sister. And she's like, yeah, our grandfather, he's from Tuguegarao, Cagayan, in the northeastern part of the Philippines. And she was like, oh, they speak a language called Ibanag there. And it's like the only language in the, and, and yeah, she told me back then, like, it's the only language in the Philippines that has the F sound. And she, she, is, and she was caught, and she said, they, and people there, um, they sound like they're birds singing. And she like did like, <laughs> like to, to, uh, to demonstrate that. And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like, sound like birds singing. But anyway, I got the idea. So I was interested in like finding out more about Biko, more about Cebuano, and more about Ibanag. And I'm like, there's nothing that's accessible to me as as a teenager living in suburban uh Seattle area, you know, and um, this was before I moved to the rural area, but there, there was nothing much that I could find. So I, and the internet at the time was, was not as, you know, as not as comprehensive. It was the late nineties as it is today. Um, so I had, I sought out like hard to find books that I had to get, that I had to obtain via interlibrary loan. One of those were the University of Hawaii's, um, Pali uh, series, and which in which they created textbooks in seven of the eight major languages at the time. So they didn't do any for Pangasinan for some reason, but they did for and they did. They, oh no, they did it for Pangasinan, but they did it for they did not do it do any for uh, Waray Waray for some reason, but they did it for Cebuano, Bico, Ilocano, and so on and so forth. But these were um, kind of old, and I wanted something newer, and I ended up. Uh, reaching out to linguists like uh, John Wolfe, uh, Lawrence Reed, uh, uh, Jason Lovell, Carl Rubino. Um, and I, and I developed a friendship with- Did you ever reach uh, out to Zork? Oh yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still in, yeah, I, I definitely reached out to Dr. Zork. I'm, I'm, I, I was just talking to him the, uh, a couple weeks ago. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I uh, I maintained a close uh, close friendship with Jason Lobel, and at the time he was a master's degree student down in San Diego, and he uh, was involved heavily in um, in the languages of Bicol, 
and I was like, oh my God, you're from Bicol, you know, and uh, are you, you're in Bicol, you're studying the Bicol languages. Tell me all about my, <laughs> my family's language. And he was like, well, and, and, you know, he shared me with like his field data um, for like each town had its own um, variety, you know, and I was like, this is great. And I was like, I was amazed by the amount of, the amount of differences between each of these towns. Bicol is one of those languages that's really like a cluster of languages yeah, um, yeah. You know. and and the saying there's a whenever you cross a river in beagle they speak another language or dialect there so um but yeah um at some point jace jason said to me like if i could if i can convince you uh to become a linguist that would help and i considered that you know and at some point i'm like yeah, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a linguist. I, I like. I like this. I want to contribute to the existing knowledge. You know, because nobody, nobody else is writing about our languages now. There are, but I mean, there's there's a lot more people writing. But at the time, you know, it was hard for young Filipino Americans like me to learn something that is not Tagalog. Yeah, I I feel like. Um... There was a period in maybe like the 70s or the 80s where like peace score was active mm -hmm. in the philippines and like there was like a whole bunch of documentation and stuff being done and then there was a gap after you know after the peace Corps pulled out mm -hmm. um interesting and it's interesting that you're Bicol. one of my favorite fun facts about B about you know Bicol is um the the angry register that some varieties have yeah yeah, if the, the angry register is something is something that I'm interested in. I want I want to I want to try to get into the mindset of native speakers so that I can use the angry register effectively because I don't I don't think that I quite have it, you know. And um, I tried to get my my, my grand both of my grandmothers are still alive. Um, one of them is ninety, the other one is eighty six. Um, they they just say they just say they use filipinos like to say when you ask them about language like something in the grammar they'll just say oh we use that for emphasis so that's the that's the kind of unsatisfying answer that i usually get and i'm like that's not enough for me so i just i just have to look at more linguistic data try to get an idea but for me as a tagalog speaker you know it's like the the way the, the how the way that i can get close to this is just like when people use uh, a swear word or something or some kind of um, derogatory word. But from my understanding, it's like not about being derogatory in Bicol. It's more about expressing your emotion, you know, but even in Tagalog or other languages, you're also expressing your emotion when you use a word like that. So maybe I'm just overthinking it and I just should accept, I should just accept that as emphasis. Who knows? But... <laughs> yeah. The Bicol is, uh, it's interesting to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, yeah. One, just culturally, I like spicy food mm -hmm. and I do not want to shame the Philippines, but large swaths of the Philippines have white people power. <laughs> um, and what I, what I mean by that is, um, you know, like, especially like, uh, like you mentioned, you know, what I people, they got this concept of one herb, one dish where like they mm -hmm. put they put like one spice in a dish and they call it seasoned. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very much a fan of Nicolano's use of, of chili. <laughs> I like chili. Mm -hmm. um, coconut milk, I can take or leave, but mm -hmm. I do like a little bit of heat. And that's really cool. The other cool thing is um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I guess Bicol is part of that 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 sort of Sprachbund where they have the politeness particle. So some varieties of Bicol uh, of 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 Bicolano they have you know I think Tabi for for they put them on like Bo, um, mm. for marking politeness and yeah it's very interesting. Yeah. I I feel like the Tagalog language area is encroaching into Bicol. And I think there's a couple of reasons. One, because it's right next door. Two, because I think uh, Bicol Central is essentially like a foreign language to a lot of, 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 of 
equal speakers. So it's not too big of a jump. Like, well, if I have to learn another language to communicate with my neighbors, I could just learn Tagalog, which is the national language. And I, I think that, yeah, they're, they're kind of coming under threat from yeah. Tagalog right now. Yeah, from from my recollection, the the westernmost part of Camarines Sur, the, the municipality of uh, Del Gallego, is already Tagalog speaking. And then um, my paternal grandmother's um, hometown is Daet. And that's like, uh, they speak, uh, they mix Tagalog and people together, um, essentially. Um, so, but I, I, I assume they do that more now than in my uh, grandmother's generation because she's able to, um, for her, when, when she, she was telling me when she uh, was a teenager, you know, she really did not get to learn um, Tagalog until, and she makes up a lot of words until she moved to Makati and when she, after she married my grandfather. So, yeah, the, the linguistic situation in the Philippines is quite interesting, especially with older generations. Mm -hmm. um, I met an elderly woman in Southern Leyte, and she did not speak Tagalog at all, mm -hmm. but she spoke. Um, she spoke. She spoke essentially, um, sort of like Boholano, um, and she also spoke English. Mm -hmm. because she grew up on during the American occupation and she was fortunate enough to have been educated to some degree in English. But it was really interesting that um, this, is, this had been several years ago and it was one of my first times to the Philippines. I was very dead set on, I'm in the Philippines, I'm going to use Filipino. And um, at some point I came to the realization, oh, she just doesn't actually speak Tagalog. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting where you've got the older generations who may not have that command of the language um, or other surprising things. You know, people surprise you when I was in the middle of nowhere again in the eastern Visayas and there were some, um, you know, coconut farmers who had a conversational command of Spanish because they took it oh. in school at the time. And just like yeah. things that surprise you constantly. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, Tagalog was not relevant in their day-to-day -day lives so but mm. you know maybe english or something some other language uh, was so that's what they're able to be that's what they're able to be uh fluent in or more conversational in. Mm. yeah so what languages do you speak uh when i was talking to our mutual acquaintance uh don i was like hey i'm gonna be talking to chris in the podcast and he's like, well, he speaks like 10 languages. And I don't know if that was hyperbole, but uh, it sounds like you're quite the accomplished polyglot. Well, I, I'm not sure about that. But uh, I, yeah, so I, I've, um, my standard answer is that I speak four um, really well. So English, obviously, and Tagalog, which um, the language of my family. Uh, and then as for uh, foreign languages, um, my strongest uh, foreign language is Spanish, and then um, the second one is French. Uh, but I have um, studied various languages over since you know since I was a teenager. So I, my my abilities in those languages they uh, they vary very wildly. So um, I would say, yeah. So I, like I, I think I'm pretty conversational in like Portuguese because it's close to Spanish um, and. I, I had a, I have a interest in uh, Catalan um, of of Spain, right? Or well, the, the Catalonia, the Cat Catalonia, and um, other parts of uh, France and Andorra and um, Sardinia. Uh, I studied. Uh, I took classes. In, I took a Russian class in college. I also took a quarter of Greek. I took uh, two years of Icelandic and I took two years of Greek. Um, Icelandic. And I also took two years of Hebrew, modern Hebrew. Uh, and uh, in grad school, I took uh, three years of Indonesian. And uh, I also took two years of Mandarin Chinese. Um, but I've also, I try, you know, I tried, I tried studying Italian. You know, I can probably get by in Italy, you know, just because of my knowledge of other Romance languages. Uh, and uh, also the various, like the basics of, the, of, of Philippine languages I know, um, like uh, Bicol, 
uh, Kamapangan because I lived in Pampanga for uh, four years, five, oh, five years when I was a kid. And, and uh, my elementary school years were spent in Pampanga. But um, my family and I don't really speak the language. And my interest in Kapampangan happened after I, uh, when, when my family returned to the States. Um, and I, I was looking for a couple of um, books. And I, that's for me, that, that's kind of like my home province in a way, because that's where I lived. And I spent like my formative childhood years there, but I don't have like a, a family connection. Um, we're not, we're not Kapampangan people. Uh, and Ilocano, because Carl Rubino back in the late 90s, he wrote an amazing dictionary and grammar, which helped me a lot and University of Hawaii has some very good resources for Ilocano and also Cebuano so I know some Cebuano and and I've also studied um, some Taosug I wrote a grammar sketch of Taosug which Jason Lobel helped me publish back in 2004 um, I know a little bit of Warai Warai I know a little bit of Asi spoken in western in, in the province of Romblon in western Visayas um, and a little bit of Ibana because of my family connection in Tutuguegarao. So, um, and going back to high school, I'm jumping around my timeline. That's but great. going back in, in high school, I took, yeah, I took Spanish and French classes. And my junior year, they started offering Japanese. So I was taking, and then I was taking um, like half of my classes were, almost half of my classes were language. I had Spanish, French, and Japanese. Um, classes in high school and and in that part of Washington that I lived in um, uh, which isn't near Tacoma Washington uh, there's a very large Korean community and everywhere I went there's Korean science and I'm like I should learn how to read that you know and I did and I, learning Korean um, learning Hangul was 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 simple korean phonology is a whole other thing um but i i so i speak a very little bit of korean i can still read hangul but um my focus my focus lately ha for the past nine years is uh, mandarin chinese on and off because my husband is from taiwan um and his but he speaks english he speaks english way better than i do mandarin so we ended up we, we end up speaking mandarin more but when i speak to my in-laws I speak to them in Mandarin Chinese because that is the, that is the language that they speak, and they and their English is um, yeah they're 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 they're, Eng they're not really confident in their English, skills. so I always I always FaceTime them in Mandarin. So I do not want to uh, impose too much upon your private life, but your husband is uh, from Taiwan. Yes. Is he also interested in you know because Taiwan uh, is the the homeland of Austronesian languages as far as we know. Um, is he at all involved in, you know, sort of Austronesian linguistics or anything? Oh no, he's he's not a linguist at all. So not he's, all. you know, he's in the healthcare field. So, uh, gotcha. his, uh, but you know, he he's uh, he's familiar with uh, with the Austronesian um, the Austronesian peoples in in Taiwan, and because uh, he's been he's been to like the the parks there, and also and there, uh, I think uh, the, the nearby the villages nearby. He's from Kaohsiung. And his parents, okay. are, yeah, and his parents are always send. They always send uh, send us pictures of their uh, hikes, you know, near those villages, and they know that I'm interested in it. So I'm like, oh wow, I, this is really cool because I haven't been there yet. But you know, when when we finally go to Taiwan, yeah, I'll be I'll be going there myself. So very cool, yeah. And um, is one of your you know, I, I believe so. You you have a blog, or you had a blog like twenty years ago, um, and you know, I think your ability to parse Spanish, being a strong Spanish speaker, you were able to read like some colonial era texts and stuff. And I'm imagining a lot of documentation and stuff with the indigenous Taiwanese languages are going to be in uh, Mandarin. Is that the case? Um. I, yeah, for you're talking about Taiwan, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I believe so, and I and I seem to remember some kind of um, grammar for, uh, written in Spanish. Actually, I think I think it's for Taiwanese for a Taiwanese Hokkien um, that that's written in Spanish. But I think for the most part, everything is written in um, 
in Chinese. Um, and I think, and that, that was one of the reasons why when I was in grad school, I wanted to take Mandarin because I was interested in going to Taiwan and communicating, you know, with the, with the, uh, the Austronesians there, um, which, ne- which did not pan out for various reasons, but yeah, that was my, that was my primary reason for learning Chinese back then. Um, but it, I, I, because of, uh, because of my husband, you know, I, I continued with it. So. Very cool. Yeah. I, um, you know, the, the, the Chinese languages, uh, are just not super interesting to me at like a, a base level. Um, mm-hmm. there's, there's something about, you know, Austronesian grammar that is just fascinating, you know, Austronesian alignment, um, things like this, whereas um, the Sinitic languages just don't interest me that much, I, I, you know, at a personal level. But I think, you know, I used to work for a Chinese company and I, I dabbled in Mandarin, but I never got very good. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that if I ever did go back to Mandarin, I would love to be able to read some of the stuff. Actually, there was a, um, a book about Austronesian linguistics published in Mandarin very recently. Um, and you know, I think, yeah, I definitely think that any, like, uh, any person interested in, in Austronesian languages, you need to sort of have a background in Spanish, French, Dutch, and Mandarin, (laughs) uh, to get on as well. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Indonesia publishes some stuff in Indonesian about the, uh, the languages there. Mm -hmm. Um, that's very cool. So what, what? is academia like for those of us who are just you know sort of like you were 20 years ago just hobbyists who like language and stuff uh what what is ac- academia like i've never been part of it yeah i have i've i've, met, I've uh, been to conferences and i've attended many talks so i mean it's uh <laughs> maybe i should put sugarcoat it but anyway uh, it's uh you know you, you present your ideas and you get uh you you generate discussion, which uh, is, which many times uh, has been very spirited. Um, I've I've sat in on various talks where linguists in the audience will um, give you know they will give their uh, critiques uh, in a, of a of an analysis or of a, a conclusion to an analysis, and there, there's a lot of discussion generated there. Um, but yeah, it's. I think. I think it's just a constant. From I, I guess, if I had to describe academia in a nutshell, it's like just a constant uh, exchange of ideas. Like even after when you publish something, there's gonna, there's gonna probably gonna be, there might be rebuttal papers. You know, saying, well, I disagree with the analysis here, and this is why, based in, in light of this data. So, I, th- I, you know, I think you always have to be. You have to be on your A game, you know, like if you if you believe if you believe in why a certain linguistic phenomenon is um, this way, um, you have to like know the data inside and out and make sure that you've collected the right data. Otherwise, somebody is going to come around and um, bring counter data or like something that (laughs) that you had not considered before. So it's it's healthy because it's great. It's great that it's. uh, it's great that there's discussion about these kinds of topics and it'll help you refine your understanding, your thinking um, about, about these topics. But at the same time, you know, I think there's also that it can, it can get toxic at times, you know, I think, and yeah, <laughs> that's how it was. I, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm, 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 I'm kind of chuckling right now, just thinking about all the, the, I'm having like a flashback of different kinds of arguments and things like that, but yeah. Um, it's, it's not, for, it's not for, it's not for everybody. And I think ultimately I decided it wasn't for me, um, but I do miss it a lot. And maybe, maybe who knows, you know, like I'll get, I mean, I, I see parallels with the corporate world, you know, I might just end up yeah. going back to academia. So and when you were actively like working as a linguist um you mentioned earlier that you published like a grammar sketch of Talsuk. Mm-hmm. um what other sort of papers have you published relating to well anything linguistically like um um 
what all was your work about? So um, my work, um, I can. So the, you, you mentioned earlier, like from my blog, the uh, the the prefixes or the affixes in Tagalog, right? So when I went to pursue my bachelor's degree at the University of Washington, um, I was interested in doing um, the depart departmental honors uh, uh, option. So that required um, working under the supervision of a uh, professor and creating your um, thesis, your honors thesis. So my honors thesis was um, was a, was went into the details of um, the development of the Galug Um, the the Um infix. So I. The, I decided to do that when I took uh, historical linguistics with um, my professor Edith Aldridge. So Edith Aldridge is primarily a syntactician who um, who who who's a uh, looked into the syntax of Tagalog, Malagasy, um, and uh, Chinese, and I and I believe Japanese, because she speaks. She she got her. She went to school in Japan as well. But um, she was my she was my intro to linguistics te uh, professor, and also um, my syntax one and syntax two professor. So I was already familiar with her. And then I took her, I took her historical linguistics class, and I'm like, oh, and she she knows about the dialogue. I think she would be a good. Um, a good advisor for this thesis so and she agreed and she you know and the rest is history i wrote i, I wrote that thesis and um and i and then i uh i yeah i got that done and then i want i was interested in um i went into grad school i pursued um a doctorate at cornell um and I, at cornell my primary focus was um phonology and phonetics um, that which is yeah a, a huge interest of mine um, and one of the things that I wanted to do at Cornell was um, write a historical paper um, to um, continuing what I did on, on with the Tagalog um uh, thesis that I did so uh, I ended up uh, I ended up like uh, picking that as a research uh, presentation that I gave at the 2015 uh, Linguistic Society of America meeting in Portland, Oregon. Um, so I, I the, the topic that I chose was the development of um, the verbal morphology in uh, proto-central Philippines. So I was trying to reconstruct that. Yeah, it was still, and it still is, <laughs> a work in process. But I gave what I could at the time. Um, so um, I've never, yeah, I was I, I was never able to um, finish that because I left. But um, but yes, that that was one of the things that I I presented. But I was also working on phonetics projects, and one of them was exploring um, or phonetics and phonology projects. And one of them was exploring uh, Kapampangan questions. So in Kapampang, so I should, I guess I should step back. In Kapampangan, Kapampangan has three vowels, right? Three, well, mm -hmm. and five, I five, am. and or maybe two more, five marginal, or two of them are marginal phonemes. But uh, I would argue three. that two of the vowels in Tagalog are marginal too. But yeah, they are. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah, that that would be one of my arguments, but. Um, I know very little about Kampanganan. I know they have a question marker like body, maybe. That's yeah. that's like the extent of my <laughs> of my Kampanganan knowledge. So yep, yeah, and and so if you notice that in Tagalog, a lot of the words end in O. You like you, you see like this complementary distribution of U oh, and O. Right? And you get U mm -hmm. um, before the end of a syllable, and you get O at the at the end of a syllable. And then and in Manila Tagalog, at least, and I think in um, Batangueño Tagalog. Um, you, um, I mean, we write it as e, the i, the i vowel. We write it as e, or we write it as i. But then, in at the end of a, a utterance, um, in those varieties of Tagalog, you know, it, it comes out it's as all. 
Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So like, in, like we write, let's say, like, uh, um, what's the word? Sabi. Oh, like, like sab. Yeah, like S A B I, right? We write S A B. We don't, but you know, for, we don't really. I don't really say sabi, right? It sounds, it, it doesn't sound right, but um, so it comes out as sabi. Ano si sabi mo? Ano nangyari? Lat ano nangyari? So, so uh, in in Kapampangan, they uh, their for them their vowels they get they get e at the end of words and but they also get u at the end of words right but in right. the question so like, yeah. uh-huh. like i think that in tagalog po is the 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 sort of politeness marker and i think in, in kapampang it's pu yes correct but if you're asking a question the vowel moves so like if you want to say like okay so an example would be in kapampang like and this is what, from one of my um research projects i i i had speakers say uh, a sentence which is uh, a declarative sentence so the pig um mete ya ing babi which is the the pig die the pig died and then uh but then if you want to ask it uh, ask it as a question that babi becomes babe so mete ya ing babe and for the Kapampanga speakers, if there are any listening, sorry for butchering the accent, but, and then, um, yeah, but you get the idea. The Babi becomes Babe and, and yes, no questions when there are no other uh, inter- interrogative words in the, in, in the sentence. So if you, if you, if there's like the word, what, like what did the pig eat or whatever like that, that is not going to change. Babi is not going to change the Babi. It's going to remain as Babi. Similarly, in if we want to change the pig to turtle, Pa, uh, turtle is pawu. It'd be like meteyang meteyang pawu, right? It's the, the the turtle died, but the, if the turtle died, it would be meteya in pawu. Uh, and then and then with the a two, the a change is usually a uh, at the end of a at the end of a, a utterance, and then it becomes a uh, if it's a question. So that's what I was looking into, and um, uh, the the role. The, the interaction between phonology and phonetics, um, there, how, how they, uh, what happened, yeah, what happens there with the phonology and phonetics, and also looking into like uh, the monophthongs because a lot of uh, papangan I and ao they become I become and ao yeah, and all. yeah. Mm-hmm. and those are those seem to be um, those actually in, seem seem like pretty pretty common cross-linguistically because there are Tagalog speakers who have the same smoothing. You know, um, I've heard plenty of natives say me for my, yep. and like uh, ayao becomes, you know, ayoko, right? Yep. Like the, so that seems pretty common. Also, uh, there are some varieties of Malay where kao becomes ko. Mm-hmm. So like, um, you know, it just seems common enough cross linguistically. I think the same thing happened in English, even. I think um, the older ao diphthong gave way to the 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 o sound, like in law. Yeah. Well, I don't. I've <laughs> I've got some cot cot stuff going on, so I actually don't have the sound. But uh, for speakers who do have it, I think that o sound, like caught mm-hmm. and law, uh, came from a smoothing of 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 those diphthongs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. I, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, there is, there is, um, and I so, and I wish I continued that research. Yeah, there's so much cool stuff. I did not know that about Kampambangan having, um, you know, the the vowel marking a, a yes no question. That is fantastic. And regarding the development of, you know, the Tagalog um infix, um, I remember from your from your old blog um, that there actually within living memory there were speakers who so the modern um infix is a it's a merger of two infixes right i think um and um with yes. uh, the velar nasal right. and within living memory there were speakers who kept them distinct yes so um as of so i think it was leonard bloomfield who wrote that tagalog grammar or was it blake it's either Bloomfield or Blake or maybe both. Um, they wrote, they wrote about Tagalog in the early 20th century. So there were, spe- according to them, there were speakers um, who were still using um, that 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 special infix that 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 mer- that, san- that infix that's sandwiched from umin into um 
you know, they, there, there are some people using that at the beginning of the 20th century. And um, I was trying, I, I remember when I was writing the thesis, I was looking in vain for like recordings from that time. And it's very hard to hear, um, hear that difference. But like, I, I remember list, trying to listen to, I believe, uh, the mother, the, the wife of the pre of president Manuel Quezon, she has a speech from the forties. And if, you know, and that the um, uh, infix was what would, would have been in her lifetime, but unfortunately I didn't, I didn't hear it um, in her speech. And I remember trying to listen to other like Tagalog movies at the time. There's a, the 1939 Tagalog movie, Giliu Po, which is, which is full of like, Arch archaisms like things that we wouldn't say you know today and i tried I, I i listened closely i mean if it was there i may have missed it but i i i could you know i couldn't um i did not encounter it at all so i wish i did maybe maybe they're out there somewhere but you know that would be great if it's out there i'm, I'm curious yeah. yeah for sure um and also one of my favorite posts under your old blog uh, to anybody who is listening, again, Chris did this like 20 years ago. He was a baby linguist. So, uh, but um, it sounds like Tagalog had vowel harmony at one point. Yeah, I, you know, I, it looks like, yeah, if you look, if you look at the, 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 the old the grammars from that time and, and the and the dictionaries from that time. So what happens is you have the um infix, right? Uh, you get it like a kuma in sumula, mumasa, so on and so forth. Uh, but if if the first vowel in that word is i or e, um, then the um becomes an in. So like the example you gave, like tuming in becomes timing in. Timing in, and then lumipad becomes limipad, yeah. and then one of my favorite one of my favorite sentences from one of the from the dictionaries, the example sentences they use is for the Tagalog word meow, which is the meow of a cat, and they had the, the sentence had to do with um, meow, <laughs> so the meowing of the cat. So I thought that you know that that sentence always. Uh, stuck out to me um but yeah is so yeah it looks like at first glance there there is a uh and like some kind of vowel harmony going on but why but it's weird about just why there why in this particular case so i'm i'm rethinking that i'm not sure i have some ideas but i won't i won't get into it now until i'm able to articulate what those ideas are at some point but um yeah, I, I would put an asterisk on that for now, but that's that's something that I've been that I've been thinking in passing these past couple of years because people people have brought it up to me and I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm not so sure now, but we'll see. Yeah, um, Austronesian linguistics can be interesting um, because you know. That there's the tree model and the wave model, right? And the tree model doesn't work super well with a lot of Austronesian languages. And what's interesting to me is that historically speaking, um, sometimes some sound changes happen in like, you know, in the Philippines and they happen across language lines, but they, they happen in weird ways. Like, like, you know, Cebuano and Tagalog sort of having this R become an L, um, but then it skipped what I, but then it hit, you know, um, it hit, you know, Longo and um, all sorts of, you know, interesting things happen there. And yeah, I've read some of Zork's discussions about Tagalog and, um, you know, I'm I, one of the examples I usually give people is like Tagalog happens to by pure chance be the, the sort of the official language of the Philippines, the national language. But it's by all means not a really typical Central Philippine language. It's actually kind of weird for being a Central Philippine language. Um, you know, from from vocab, it's got a lot of like Kampampangan words. Um, it's got a lot of Malay words. Um, and it's got a lot of weird sound changes. Just weird sound changes like um, 
you know, uh, and it can kind of obscure the the history of words if you're not familiar. Right. Yeah, like, I, I, um, I think you're alluding to like uh, like the word Baha'i, like the, what, what what Tagalog did with the L's and in mm -hmm. relation to stress, like whereas most Philippine languages would have Balai for house, right. Tagalog has Baha'i and then, or Uod for worm, whereas you would expect you know an L there. Yeah, or the word for moon and month, bulan, in other mm. Philippine languages, but buwan in Tagalog. Yeah. Right. And this th this is like one of the reasons why the concept of a Filipino language is not the, the I, I guess, well, stepping back, like, I, I guess, like, the, the, tr the vision of the, of the, of the so-called Filipino language was to be, like, based upon other Philippine languages. But if you look at the the current state of Filipino today, I mean, it's basically Tagalog, right? Wouldn't a more universal Philippine language like account and maybe, well, incorporate uh, words that are used by at least a plurality, if not a majority of, of Philippine languages? And that's, that. yeah, Buan and Baha'i Baha and all that, those wouldn't be there. We would, we, we would be speaking something else and not to mention the the suffix in, right? The 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 object focus or, tra or transitive uh, transitive uh, suffix in is is found, I think, in Tagalog and maybe a, a couple more Philippine languages, but in the languages of in in, in, in the languages of uh, Visayas and Bicol, it's uh, un on, and then in the north it's un, and Kapampanga it's an, you know. So, right, Tagalog had that. Um that, you know, if Sork is correct, early Tagalog had a three-vowel system. Yeah. Um, uh, but that's from an earlier four-vowel system where the schwa became an E sound. Yes. Uh, and I can only assume that certain things are doublets, actually, like uh, sik sik and sak sak. I assume sak sak is probably from Canton Bangan or something. Um, probably, yeah. You know, to sik sik is like no new stuff, but sak sak is like stab right mm -hmm. yeah. and I, I can only assume that they're cognate they're doublets but you know tagalog is also sort of at the peripheries of central philippine mm -hmm. you know um it's sort of disconnected from it the is, central yeah. philippine homeland and as a result um its grammar is just a little bit different you know it's retained some things that have been lost in other central philippine languages it's innovated some stuff um and my, my example would be like, French is kind of actually a weird romance language, but because it's so prestigious and because there's so much exposure to it, mm -hmm. um, people don't look at it as like being strange. Their example is always like, oh, look at Romanian. It's a weird language. I'm like, actually, French is pretty weird if you compare it to something like, uh, you know, Italian and Catalan. Um, and... Tagalog is that way. I always say it's actually kind of like the French or the Romanian of, of the Philippines. Oh. I never heard that before, but that is an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, because, you know, it's it's just not very typical for a Central Philippine language, but it has that prestige and everybody's familiar with it. It seems normal. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things, I, one of the blog entries that I wrote, I think back in 2004, was... I've been argue I had been arguing that Filipino is not universal enough, but that at the same time, I think I also I also put the propose that maybe Filipino is maybe maybe Filipino is in a way universal. <laughs> I know I'll get comments for that, but I mean I think I think it's just another way of looking at it because it just it's it's a random it it can be seen as a random mishmash of various features from throughout the philippines but at the same time it's unique in its own way but i don't know i, I just I, I played around with that with that question um but still you know on the same on the same top op topic there um oh let me let me take a step back but i was i think in that blog that blog post too i tried to like create like a uh like a like a very draft. I mean, just a three sentence, three sentences of like an auxiliary language of what what would what would a Filipino auxiliary language look like? And I and I gave my I gave some sample sentences there based on what I knew at the time. 
about the nature of other Philippine languages. But currently, there is somebody who is um, uh, taking a serious serious effort in creating one. I'm not sure if you've Luis heard of him, the Luis, Vim, Luis Vimindan project, and um, he's been, uh, I think it's, I think it's a he, but he's been posting snippets here and there of this language that he's trying to create and the methodology that he's using to um, to construct a lexicon. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what he come up, what what, what uh, he come up comes up with in the end. Yeah, I think. I, I do not suspect that um, a project like that for you know making an auxiliary language is gonna ever like be a reality, but it's definitely cool to see. Um, but what I think is happening, and I don't know really what the research is saying, mm -hmm. is I've noticed a stark difference in L1 and L2 Tagalog speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is there's a couple of things. So you've got these neo dialects of Tagalog like that are coming out of like Davao and and things like that um you got these sort of new dialects of people who've you know mixed it with other languages or they've they've had some sort of language shift but you also have a sort of a simplification um some some affixes are just not used by l2 speakers mm -hmm. some conjugations are simplified um uh, i feel like Ethnic Tagalogs tend to prefer like very hyper specific words, whereas you see more sort of like word phrases in in L2 speech. Like um like I can't think of the word dalampasigan or something. It's like it means to like splash around and play in the water. Mm -hmm. And like I feel like an L2 speaker would say something like play in the water, like you know, they would calc it from from English or something. Um, right. Yeah. Exactly. They would avoid those super hyper specific uh, words that specifically mean just one word. It's like you know. Uh, or the, my my favorite one. What was the other? Like uh, oh, for nosebleed, dumudugo ang ilong. Right. That's like the like the mm -hmm. like the most literal way of saying it. But there's this word that I learned, um, the baling wing wing, which means nosebleed which i which i which i think is great but and i, and I want to use it more but yeah it's uh, i i see what you mean they, they they instead of using that specific word they just uh they they just use a more literal uh way of yeah. saying it and i think another another one is that kind of gets on my nerves sometimes i don't I'm not get on my nerves but kind of like a pet peeve is like and i'm and i'm yeah anyway it's uh maghapon all day long and the other one is magda mug all night long, right? And I know some people will say buong araw, which I think is a calc from English, and buong gabi. All day. Yeah, all, all day, night. all night. But I said, no way, we have authentic, we have authentic Tagalog words that that concisely describe this phenomenon, you know? Yeah. We don't use an English calc. People will say like masakilang ulo, right? Instead of saying uh, inulo, right? Like inulo ako. And there's definitely a stark difference between ethnic Tagalog speakers and L2 speakers. Oh yeah. I'm not into, I'm not super into native speakerism. You know, oh. as an English teacher, I saw, um, I saw a lot of discrimination towards like Filipino speakers of English and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's like a whole debate in the English teaching field is like, should native speakers be the model? And then it becomes like, what is a native speaker? <laughs> right. Um, and you know um if you moved to the u.s when you were relatively young i mean are you a native english speaker are you is it different because i was raised in the states until i was 13 and you you were abroad and like that's a whole debate but yeah. i definitely have an appreciation for ethnic tagalog speech um yeah. one of my favorite games to play is i read a lot of what that i read a lot of filipino uh web fiction and stuff and I always play where is the author from and i after reading a couple of chapters i can usually guess i'll go to their author page and i'll be like okay you're from laguna called it or okay you're from Bas you know you're you're a Visayan. i can tell because you you do you know you've got your Visayasms in your speech um but there definitely is a, a you can tell someone's background by how they speak tagalog if they're ethnically tagalog if they speak a philippine language and there's this conyo speech that is pretty common as well. I've got some wealthy friends who 
it almost feels like they're speaking Indonesian or Malay because oh. the, the grammar's just not there. Like, you know, like, punta komaya maya. And I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, they, they don't just, they just don't like, um, yeah, conjugations aren't there, you know, and like vocab isn't there. And it's sort of, it's a very interesting phenomenon to see. Yeah. We are nearing the end of our hour, and I do not want to keep monopolizing your time, although it's been so cool. Um, yeah, finally, great. finally talking to you after all of these years of uh, being your fanboy on Twitter. And uh, <laughs> um, before we go, is there anything that I did not bring up that you wanted to talk about today um, while you got the audience and got the spotlight? Oh, shit. You know, where do I begin? <laughs> um... I don't know. I, I guess, uh, gosh, my mind is drawing a blank. Um, but I mean, uh, God, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, no pressure. Uh -huh. Um, and in that case, before we go, um, what would be your one piece of sage advice to people who are either language learners or they're like hobbyist linguists, they, you know, they're interested in linguistics, history, and stuff like that. What would your piece of advice be? Well, I, so I think there's two things going on here. So the first one is like, because I, I think, yeah, I think there are two, dis, two distinct interests, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who have both, right? But if you're a learner of somebody who's, who want, if you are learners of a language that's not, that's not spoken by a lot of people and resources are hard to come by. I mean, what worked, what worked for me was I started creating my own resources, right? I, I mentioned before that I was interested in in Tao Suk, right? I wrote I wrote a grammar sketch of Tao Suk. I mean, that came from uh, an interest, a, a strong desire that I had to know more about um, the language of of the people in the Southern Philippines, who I really knew nothing about. I never, you know, I I, I grew up in a in the in the north um, in a Catholic uh family and i did not know any anybody any filipino muslims right from the south so i was very curious about the the language that they spoke and it was and resources were hard to come by right um there was like one one dictionary from the that was published by the summer institute of linguistics written by uh uh seymour and ashley and hassan seymour ashley and hassan irene hassan um but you know, it's, it was more. It's more about a dictionary, but not a grammar book. But I, I, I but I did know that the 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 gra the grammar is similar. Also, grammar is similar enough to Tagalog, right? I mean, they, they it's con they con yeah, they conjugate the same way, you know. Um, uh, and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap there that I could use to my advantage. And I've used this and I've used this when learning Romance languages, right? Like as if I'm even though I, I've never really formally studied Italian, you know, like okay, I, well I speak French and Spanish. There's some there there are definitely elements there, you know, that I could use in, in Italian. So my, my advice to you is, you know, leverage what you know about the language uh, what you know about um, related languages and then also seek out native speakers. Ask you know, um, ask them like and pay them. By the way, <laughs> you know, make make sure you guys. Yeah, I, I, as I there's that, like exploitation of like minority linguistics groups is kind of as a thing too, and I and I, I feel like they should be paid for their work. But but that's yeah, but that's an important that's an important side note. But the point is there is like yeah, get, get the help of um, willing native speakers, and you can construct your own grammar and. Um, and use that to obtain resources and even speak to um, other native speakers. But I think what it boils down to, what it boils down to is like using the language as much as you can with native speakers. I mean, I, there's all these different, um, there's all these polyglots on YouTube and TikTok and other, other social media platforms. Like they will, they, they will promote their way of um, learning a language. I mean, which, which is great for them. If it works, if it works for you, then stick with that. Um, but um, there are different, there are there are different methods of learning a language, and I don't think any one method is wrong. I mean, um, but yeah, for me, I use uh, in my in my language learning journey, I've used I've used a variety of uh, methods. Um, it's kind of like 
people ask me, how do you learn a language? I'm like, huh, well, <laughs> sit down and we can talk about it in a podcast. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, th I think, I, yeah, I, I think that's what I want to say, you know, to, to your previous question, you know, I think there's, there's more than one way of learning a language and uh, whatever works best for you, just run with that. Um, because for me, yeah, I, my, my, my method of learning languages is just kind of haphazard. You know, I, I, I like, I like pouring over dry, boring um, reference grammars. I could do that all day. I mean, I've done that all day, you know? Yeah, you know it. And I, and I also like watching, I don't know, Disney movies in like Icelandic or something like that, or like chatting with people on the internet in their language, or even dating people or marrying people who speak the language that, that, that I wanted, I, I learned. So it's, yeah. and. I mean, yeah, if, if I, in, in a perfect world, if money were not a uh, issue, you know, I would live, I, I would put myself in, in, in that area that speaks that language and I would immerse myself and use that language every day. But we don't have that privilege, right? Not everybody has that privilege. Um, and then for linguistics, I, I get a lot of people ask, uh, a lot of younger people who um, approach me and say, hey, I'm interested in linguistics too. Uh, what do I do? How do I get into it? And I'm like, what? my number one question is, why do you want to use linguistics? And then my number two question is, like, how <laughs> do you need money? <laughs> because it's hard, at least in the States, to get uh, a job in linguistics. I mean, if you've, if you've look, looked for a job here and if you have a linguistics degree, yeah, it's, you, you know that already. My um, my advice is to um, yeah sure go study linguistics and but make sure you pair it up with a, a more a, a major that has the potential to put food on the table, you know whether that be like something in the health field or business or um, tech sector. Um, I chose the tech sector, uh, yeah, but uh, computational linguistics. Yes, um, yeah. that's where that's where the jobs are. Um, I am not a I'm not a computational linguist, unfortunately. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. I think I think you need I think you need to like uh, speak with people in the field and understand like what their journey was and how likely it is for you that um, like that you're gonna be able to provide for yourself and your family. And if you have other plans like that, I mean, uh, yeah. I just felt like. For my personal situation, that, that was not like the, that was not something that I could dedicate myself, and and be able to and be able to meet the financial obligations. And then for people who are thinking of going into um, graduate school, like for a PhD, my advice there is number one: never pay for your PhD. Your school will pay you. Um, It'll be it won't it won't be enough, but they will still pay for your tuition and they will pay for your um, they'll give you a stipend or they will give you a TA ship, right? Um, I, I was a TA for Linguistics 101. I was also in training to be a, a Spanish 101 TA. I had to take training for that, and they brought back uh, memories of when I was teaching kids a long time ago. <laughs> uh, but I was like, wow, that was college kids. Uh, how different. There's no puppets involved. But uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, um, but but know that in general, like the, the job market for PhDs is highly competitive. It's, you know, you might, and if you do end up getting a job, it might be, I don't know, um, a postdoc position, which is like a temporary position. Um, in some place that you might not like, and then that'll last for two or three years, and then you have to um, you have to do the cycle all over again. And it's that's not the life that I wanted to live, you know. Um, but uh, but if you do, great. There's a lot of I, I know a lot of accomplished linguists who do um, who did end up pursuing um, that career, like in, in academia. And I think, and I think that's great for them. I respect the work that they do. I mean, they're they're my classmates, right? And I and I they're, they're my friends, so I support them in that. But you also have to know, like, be be honest about like where you where you are in terms of employability and um, and uh, and finances and all that. Um, um, because a lot of my classmates, we ended up getting, and, and myself included, 
we ended up getting jobs outside of um, academia um, and and we're doing well more or less you know some of us some of them became teachers some of them work in in the tech industry a lot a lot of linguists that I went to um, grad school and undergrad with uh, they work for um, Amazon's Alexa team so that they that employs a lot of linguists there um, but yeah, I think I, I, I think what's important here is to is, is the finances. But if you have the finances covered, then yeah, um, go in and pursue it. But if not, then you can still be a linguist. Well, you can still get an education, uh, like an equivalent education in linguistics uh, by just reading the same textbooks that we do. Maybe discussing it in places like. Uh, our linguistics on Reddit or other um, or other discussion places like that. I mean, it can, it can it's okay if you want it to be just a, a hobby, you know, just a, a, a side interest or something like that. That's totally fine. Um, but in the end, it just depends on what you want to do with that linguistics linguistics degree and why. So. All right. And Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for the sage advice. And it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Maraming salamat. Take care. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Refold Podcast. If you're watching the live premiere, you're in luck. Right as it ends, we have an after party over on the Refold Central Discord server. Come join us by using refold.link forward slash join to chat about the episode. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to hear more, you can find older episodes to listen to on YouTube and Spotify. Let us know what you thought about the video by liking and leaving a comment below. Do you have suggestions for upcoming visitors or requests for particular topics? Please feel free to reach out to me on Discord at georgepig hashtag 5413 or via email at clayton at refold.la. Thank you all for watching and or listening, and I'll see you next week.